Hello guys, welcome to a new chapter of the Empress Dowager CG. This is gonna be chapter 9, The Life and Death of Emperor Tong Si, 1861-1875. At the age of 5 of CG's son, Tong Si was put on a rigid regime of his formal schooling, which prepared Qin emperors and princes. He was moved out of his mother's quarters and started living in a separate dwelling. Most days he was in his study by 5 a.m., when teaching would begin. When he was carried over in a sedan chair, the forbidden city was still asleep, with a few servants moving about and occasionally leaning against pillars, dozing. The handheld lanterns of his entourage would often be the only flickers of light in the darkness surrounding the alleys of the palace. His tutors, by common consent, were of the highest repute in scholarship and morality and were approved and appointed by the two Dowager Empresses. The curriculum focused on Confucian classics, with Tongsi recited without comprehension. As he grew older, he understood more and more and learned to write essays and poetry. The syllabus also included calligraphy, the Manchu and Mongolian languages, plus archery and writing. Emperor Tongsi did not take it to the sacred Confucian text like a dog to water. His main teacher, Grand Tutor Wang, moaned with immense exasperation day after day in his privacy in the diary that the emperor failed to concentrate, to read the texts out aloud with any fluency, and to write the correct characters, and he was always bored. When writing poetry, he showed little flair with ethereal themes such as clear spring water flowing over a rock, although he seemed slightly more comfortable with topics to do with royal duties like on employing good people to govern the country well. Siji and Empress Sen often required an about how their studies were going. They were dismayed that the child seemed to get into a panic as soon as he sees a book, and they cried when this was still the case just after his assumption of power. They told his teacher simply to ensure a basic comprehension of his, for his impending job, and Grand Tutor Wang reassured them that this would not be impossible, as the reports to his majesty would not be as difficult as the classics, and his edicts would be drafted by other people. Then Siji tested her son's ability in the context of an audience, and discovered that he was unable to speak distinctly or coherently. Anxiously, she urged the tutors to give him a special coaching, so that he was at least able to ask simple questions and give brief instructions. One thing the emperor was interested in was opera, which his tutors regarded as an unworthy distraction. Pleasure only to the senses. He ignored them and often even took part in acting. On such occasions he would put on makeup and perform in front of his mother, who did nothing to discourage him. As he was not a good singer, Tongsi would play the parts that involved martial arts. Once, in the role of a general, he bowed to an Enoch who played the king. The Enoch hurriedly went down on his knees, whereupon he yelled, What are you doing? You can do this when you are acting the king. This made CG love. Emperor Tongsi was also enthusiastic about Manchu dancing and would cheerfully dance for his mother. He pursued other pleasures. In the emperor's early teens, Grand Tutor Wen noticed him giggling and fooling about with his study companions. Once he seemed unable to control his giggles over a piece of the driest text which greatly puzzled the tutor. How bizarre, he exclaimed in his diary, but these were virtually the only moments where his Her Majesty seemed to have any energy, and otherwise he tended to look exhausted and unable to rouse himself from listlessness. Once he owned up that he had not slept for quite a few nights. But he forbade his teachers to ask him what the matter was and warned them sternly that no one was to say a word about this to the Empress, Sen, or his mother. Driven to his wit's end, Grand Tutor Wang even shouted at his royal pupil, but more often he confined his distress to his diary. What to do? The teenager emperor had tasted the joys of sex. The man who introduced him to this noble fawn seems to have been a good looking young scholar at court, Wang Qingji whom the emperor had taken a fancy to and installed in his study as a study companion. Together they sneaked out of the Forbidden City to visit male as well as female prostitutes whenever they could. While the emperor reveled in the wild boyhood, the court was preparing for his wedding. The process of selecting his consorts lasted nearly three years, 
interrupted by Little Ann's execution and Siege's breakdown. By the beginning of 1872, before his 16th birthday, his consorts had been chosen by the two Dowager Empresses as well as by himself. The wedding was scheduled for later that year. Out of the hundreds of eligible young girls, a Miss Salute was designated to be Empress. A Mongol, this teenage girl was universally regarded by the elite families as an exemplary lady and peerless candidate. Her father, Konji, the only Mongol ever to come topping an empire-wide imperial examination, was an absolutely devotee of Confucian values, which he instilled in the young mind of his daughter. She obeyed her father unconditionally, and could be depended on to be equally submissive to her husband. Perfectly mannered and very beautiful, she was also fluent in the classical texts, which her father had taught her himself. Empress Sen set her heart uh, on Miss Alut, so did Emperor Tongzi himself. He had no wish to sleep with her, and he reckoned that she was someone who could tolerate that without a murmur of complaint. Siji had reservations. Miss Aliut maternal grandfather, Prince Seng, had been one of the eight members on the board of regents formed by her late husband and had been ordered to commit suicide after her coup, when she had sent him a long white scarf with which to hang himself. The man she had beheaded, Su Xun, who had hated her with a vengeance, was Miss Aliut's great uncle. Miss Aliut's childhood had been marred by his family's catastrophe, as her mother's family house, an elegant mansion famous in Beijing, had been confiscated according to the penal code and the male members of the family had been barred from office. Underneath Miss Aliud's impeccable conduct, her real feelings eluded Siji, so she named another candidate, a Miss Feng Xiu, saying that she liked the girl's quick wit. But eventually Siji yielded to her son's pleading and accepted his choice. Such was her love for him. She was willing to trust Miss Aliud and had faith that her father would not have put any unfit thoughts in her mind. After the matter was settled, Siji ordered the confiscated mansion to be returned to Miss Aliud's maternal family and restored the title to the male descendants. The wedding followed the precedent set by Emperor Kangxi 200 years earlier in 1665 the last time that a ruling monarch married a girl chosen to be his empress. Empress Sen was not married as the empress, she was promoted to the position after she entered the court. Although the occasion was called the Grand Wedding, the Hun, there was no nationwide celebration, it was only the business of the court. In the Forbidden City, brightly colored silk billowed around enormous red characters reading double happiness. She. A similar display of silk was sported in the bride's mansion, particularly on top of the red pillars flanking the gate. From there to the Forbidden City, a route of several kilometers was selected for the bride to take. The dusty, rotted streets were made even and sprinkled with yellow soil, as required for a royal procession. Along this route, every morning for a week before the marriage, porters in red stops with white spots carried on the bride's trousseau to her new home. Large cabinets as well as small jade dishes, practical hardwood wash basin stands, as well as intricate pieces of art for connoisseurs. The smaller articles were displayed on yellow textile covers tables, secured by stripes of yellow and red silk. To catch a glimpse of this exhibition of imperial house furnishings, Beijing residents came out in droves at dawn, lining both sides of the route. This was their only involvement in the event. One morning, as the objects being carried were particularly precious, for security's sake the procession started before daybreak in order to meet Mr. Sightseers. After waiting in vain, they dispersed reluctantly, grumbling. Also disappointed were those who hoped to watch the training of the bridal chair bearers. As the bearers must carry the chair perfectly steadily and relieve each other quickly and without a jolt, they practice by carrying a base filled with water inside the chair, but for some reason the chair never came out at the announced time. The imperial astrologer selected October 16, 1872 to be the wedding day. Sometime before midnight, under a full moon, Miss Aliud was collected from her home by a large procession. She was dressed in a splendid robe embroidered with the pattern of a dragon. 
the Emperor and a phoenix, the Empress, intertwined. A piece of red brocade of the same pattern was dropped over her head. The road was empty. The few dogs that were running up and down and the guards along the way were the only ones permitted to gaze at the imperial pageant. The population had been told to stay away, and those who lived by the road were cautioned to stay indoors and not look out. At junctions where the royal route was joined by alleyways, blinds in bamboo frames had been erected to shut out any chance of a view. Foreign legations were told two days earlier that their nationals must keep within their own houses at this time, a request that generated outbursts of anger and frustration. What was the point of a grand state occasion, they asked, if nobody was going to see it? Among the few people who did see it surreptitiously was an English painter, William Simpson, who sneaked out into a shop on the route with a missionary friend. The shop was full of customers smoking opium, who took no notice of the foreigners or of the royal to-do. The windows were made of thin paper pasted over wooden frames and could easily be poked through. Passing in front of the hall were princes and noblemen on white horses, preceded and followed by hoisted banners, canopies and giant fans. They appear somewhat ghost-like in the dark, deserted Beijing streets, streets illuminated only by dimly lit paper lanterns, some hung and others handheld. Even the moon was veiled by clouds, as if obeying the imperial directive. Silence accompanied the slow-moving column. It was not a cheerful event and could even be described as desolate, but this was thought to be what solemnity was all about. In this atmosphere, at a few minutes after midnight, Miss Aliot, in her heavily gilded sedan chair, borne by sixteen men, crossed the threshold of the southernmost front gate of the Forbidden City. She was the first woman in 200 years to go through this gate and enter the front section of the Forbidden City, which was off-limits to all women except the Empress Bride on her wedding day. Neither Siji nor Empress Sen had ever been there. With this rarest honor, Miss Elliot sat demurely, holding two apples. Inside the Forbidden City, when she got out of the sedan chair, a prince's wife took the apples from her and placed them under two bejeweled saddles, outside the door to her wedding chamber. The word for apple contains the sound ping, and the word for saddle the sound an. Two apples and two saddles, ping ping an an, alluded to the ever-present good wish for safety and peace. This seems almost too mundane to pay fit a new empress, and yet Miss Aliot will step over those symbol-laden objects and enter her chamber to find neither. On that wedding night, when all the rituals were over, encased in a room decorated overwhelmingly in red, facing the giant character that meant double happiness, the bridegroom made their bride recite Tang Dynasty poetry instead of making love. After this obligatory night together, he spent his nights in a separate palace, a long way from her and his harem. Miss Aliot felt it was her duty to go and offer herself to her husband, but he waved her away, and she, shy and having learned not to contradict him, dutifully left. Miss Feng Xiu, Siji's preferred choice, was made the number two consort. Just before the wedding day, she was carried into the Forbidden City through the back gate, in a small sedan chair borne by just four men with a tiny procession. The almost shabby ceremony had been prescribed for a concubine. She and another three imperial concubines fared no better than the Empress, so far as their husband's affection was concerned. All five women were condemned to a life of loneliness. After the wedding, in a ceremony on 23rd February 1873, Emperor Tongxi formally assumed office. He was 16. To be an absolute monarch so young was not unusual. Bizarre as it might seem, the first two emperors of the Qin dynasty, Sun Xi and Kang Xi, took over the running of the empire at the age of 13. Emperor Tongxi's absorption of power was also a court affair, like his wedding. The people at large learned about it from the imperial declaration in a scroll lower from the Tianmen Gate copied and distributed throughout the empire in the same manner as the emperor's earlier coronation. From now on, this teenager, and he alone, will make all decisions relating to the empire, as he will now write with his crimson ink brush, 
the seals that had been stamped on the crease by the Tudor Walker Empresses were no longer used. The yellow silk screen behind which Siege and Empress Sen had been sitting was folded away and they retired into the harem. The Emperor was determined to be worthy and vowed to grant you to Wen that he would not be lazy or negligent and would not let my ancestors down. The tutor was overjoyed. For about a year the young man was as good as his word, reading reports, authorizing edicts and giving audiences. But he had none of his mother's initiative. His crimson ink instructions were brief and routine. CG stuck to the rules and did not intervene in her son's work. They were no further projects or attempts to modernize the empire. There was one exception though. Western legations had been requesting an audience with the throne to present their credentials ever since they entered Beijing. He third though, they had been told it was out of the question. The emperor was a child and the two Dowager Empresses being female could not be seen. The day after he took control, the legation sent a collective note applying for an audience. Furthermore, they insisted on seeing the emperor without going down on their knees and kowtowing. While Lord McCartney had reluctantly done so in 1793 for the sake of his trade mission, the second British envoy, Lord Armhurst, in 1816 had refused to go. Now the legations pulled their weight and demanded a kowtow free audience. Most court officials were equally uncompromising, insisting that the kowtow had to be done. Siji had already made her decision on this issue. The envoys did not have to kowtow. A few years earlier she had discussed the matter with a small circle of open-minded officials like Prince Gong, Marquis Seng and Earl Lee. And they had all agreed that they could and should compromise. Emperor Tongxi did what his mother told him to do. On 29 June 1873, he received delegation ministers without them kneeling, let alone touching their heads on the ground. This was a historic moment. The ministers stood, took off their hats and bowed at each stage as they advanced towards the throne. The dean of the diplomatic corps delivered a speech offering congratulations, and Emperor Tongxi's response of goodwill was spoken by Prince Gong. The whole thing was over in half an hour. The court made no public announcement, not wanting to draw attention to the absence of the kowtow. Among those who heard about it, Grand Tutor Wen was troubled. Some, angered than the Emperor had apparently succumbed to Western pressure, vowed to avenge this slight in the future. Apart from this one tricky matter, the bureaucracy ran automatically. Traditional Chinese administration was a well-oiled machine which, barring a crisis, would keep ticking over. Initiatives were not required and rarely offered. State policies depended almost entirely on the dynamism of the throne. While Siji was full of innovative ideas, her son was entirely lacking in them. Nor was there any particular impetus for change. Siji had brought peace, stability and a degree of prosperity to the empire. There was no peasant rebellion or foreign invasion. Nevertheless, even as a purely bureaucratic emperor, Tongxi had at least to be hands-on in order for the machine to run smoothly. Yet, he grew tired of it. The tall, good-looking and fun-loving teenager stayed in bed later and later. The number of audiences decreased until he saw just about one or two people a day and each time asked only a few stock questions. The overflowing reports were often unread and he would simply write on them to the standard, do as you propose, whether there was actually a proposal or not. Realizing this, the ministries decided they saw fit and the administration became lax. This state of affairs had already disquieted the grandees when the emperor decided to rebuild part of the old summer palace. He had visited the ruins with his mother and had been dejected by the sight of the remains of the formerly glorious buildings covered in weeds. In autumn 1873, he wrote an edict by Han announcing his intention to restore the palace. At least partially. The reason he gave was that the two Dowager Empresses needed a home for their retirement. Some felt this was reasonable. Prince Gong donated 20,000 of silver towards the cost. Siji gave enthusiastic support. The restoration was her dream. She longed to live there again. With her characteristic energy and attention to detail, she threw herself into the project, interviewing managers and architects, approving designs and mock-ups and even drawing some interiors herself. 
The construction began the following spring, and the emperor inspected the site often, urging the builders to speed up, especially with his own quarters, so that he could move in, even before the Dowager Empresses. In fact, what the young monarch wanted was a palace where he would be free to pursue his sexual adventures, while he grew negligent with his royal duties. It was widely known that he spent his time reveling and frockling with Enoch's. He continued to sneak out of the Forbidden City in disguise to visit reputable establishments. The Forbidden City was extremely inconvenient to him, as its gates had to be closed at sunset, after which not even the Emperor was allowed out without a proper reason. At closing time, the duty Enochs will cry out the sunset call in their high-pitched voices, at which the heavy gates will be pushed shut one by one and locked with a loud clang. The immense compound will then fall into total silence, with only the occasional faint sound of the tap 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 of the night watchman's bamboo blocks as they did the rounds in the Beijing streets. Noiselessly, a club was passed from hand to hand by the sentries along the walls of the Forbidden Palace. To make sure that no guard was asleep or missing and that there were no gaps in the patrols. Emperor Tongxi dreaded those sunset calls and tightly shut gates. The numerous immutable rules governing the Emperor's life, from being woken up at the prescribed time to being shadowed by note-takers recording his every move, were a permanent irritation. He wanted the old summer palace as a refuge, vast with no solid wall encircling it. This was the place where he could lead the life he wanted. Very soon, however, a chorus of opposition burst out. This followed a tradition of reprimanding the monarch if he was seen to be indulging in excessive pleasure-seeking or embarking on an inordinately expensive undertaking. Petitioners pointed out that the country was not prosperous enough, and the Ministry of Revenue presented the Emperor with a balance sheet which showed that the project was beyond the state means. The Emperor's uncle, Prince Chung, told him that this old summer palace must only be a reminder of his father's death and of his duty to avenge him. But Emperor Tongxi was set on phone, rather than revenge. He ignored his uncle and threw the report from the Ministry of Revenue back at the prostrating minister. This was not a monarch who listened to his critics, and he wrote in crimson ink denouncing the petitioners, charging them with trying to prevent him from fulfilling his filial duties. A serious sin according to Confucian ethics. Adopting the air of holding the moral high ground, the emperor fired one official as a warning and told the rest there would be punishment for those who bring up the matter again. Eventually, Prince Gong, who had come to recognize that the project was not feasible, put his name to a petition entreating his royal nephew to change his mind. The young man snapped at him. Perhaps you want me to give up my throne to you? One grand counselor, prostrating himself on the floor, was so shocked by the emperor's reaction and wept so hard that he passed out and had to be helped away. Amidst the confrontation over the rebuilding of the old summer palace, His Majesty's general lifestyle was raised disapprovingly, including his obsessive love of opera, his neglect of state duties, and in particular his nights out in disguise. Tongxi demanded to know from his two uncles who had been telling tales. Prince Chung cited the specific places of ill repute, and Prince Gong named the eldest son, who was a friend of the Emperor, as a source of the information. In a fury, the Emperor charged them with bullying him, along with other accusations that amounted to high treason. The two princes kept knocking their heads on the floor, but it did nothing to reduce the Emperor's wrath, and he penned a crimson ink edict, stripping Prince, Prince Gong and his son of their titles, sacking Prince Gong from all his posts, and placing him under guard in the department of the nobles. Another edict fired Prince Chun. Luckily for the grandees, the Emperor's mother was on hand. The grandees wrote to Siji imploring her to intervene. She came to her son's office with Empress Sen and told her son to hit the majority. Tearfully, she reprimanded him for his treatment of Prince Gong. While she talked, the young emperor stood and listened, and went down on his knees with his mother's his rebuke became emotional. The emperor was obliged to show submission to his mother, according to the traditional code. He also loved her. All the sacking orders were rescinded, and Siji had to abandon her dream of moving into the old summer palace. Emperor Tongxi was unwilling to give up his sexual pursuits outside the Forbidden City, and set his heart on the Sea Palace next door, 
dominated by a vast man-made lake, this large state housed no grand palaces but quite a few temples and buildings of architectural distinction, screened off only by symbolic walls. The living quarters had fallen into disrepair as Emperor Tongxi father and grandfather had been hard up. The grandees agreed to the refurbishment and work started straight away. The emperor became very attached to the place and continued to visit it as summer turned into winter until one day when he was out on the lake and caught a cold. The emperor also caught something much more serious. His medical records from the royal clinic showed that on 8 December 1874, rashes appeared on his skin. The next day, doctors diagnosed smallpox. The diagnosis and the prescriptions were circulated among the grand councillors. Herbs and other ingredients were mixed and brewed, into which were added special items such as earthworms, which were considered useful in extracting poison. The doctors tasted the brew first and then the Enoch chiefs did the same. The court began to observe all the rituals associated with smallpox. The way the Chinese dealt with a deadly force was, and in some ways still is, to appease it, even to put it on a pedestal in the hope that it would be mollified and would leave them alone. So a smallpox was ingratiately called heavenly flowers, Tianhua, and the emperor was said to be the enjoying the heavenly flowery happiness. Courtiers put on floral gowns, wore red, the color of joy, silk scarves and set up shrines to worship the goddess of blisters, the lady supposedly responsible for the post-filled spots. On the ninth day of the illness, the blister showed signs of maturity and release. The inner circle was invited in to see his majesty. By the side of the royal bed stood Siege and Empress Sen with candles in their hands. They asked the grandees on their knees, some distance away, to come closer. The sick teenager lay with his face towards them and raised an arm for them to inspect. They saw, as the Grand Tutor Wang described, that the flowers are extremely dense, from which his eyes are barely visible. After a while they retreated from the chamber and were then summoned to the audience hall, where Siji spoke to them at length. She was distraught and burst into sobs as she spoke. She said that her son might need some relaxation during his recovery, and if occasionally he wanted music performed, she trusted the grandees would not object. With these words of obvious reproach, the grandees repeatedly banged their foreheads on the floor. Seiji then discussed some estate affairs with them. Because he had been unable to work, she said the emperor had grown anxious during recent days. He wished the grandees to find a solution. They proposed that the two Dowager Empresses take charge, while the Emperor was enjoying the happy event. They then left to draft a petition to that effect. But Siji had second thoughts. She recalled the grandees and told them to stop writing. It had occurred to her that a petition might give the impression that the Emperor was asking to relinquish power. She decided that the request should come from her son, who, after she spoke to him, said that he was only too happy for her to step in. The following day, he summoned the grandees and appearing to have more energy than the day before, told Prince Gong in a firm voice, I just have a few words to say. There mustn't be a day when state affairs are not taken care of. I plan to beg the Dowager Empresses to deal with all the reports on my behalf, and I myself will do all my duty as before and after this happy event. Siji then told him that the grandees had already requested the same plan the previous day. Everyone was of the same mind, so the Emperor should stop worrying. The grandees left, feeling relieved and delighted that the reins of power were once again in Siege's hands. On the sixteenth day of the illness, the scabs of the young man's body began to flake off, and it seemed that he would be alright. The big shrine for the Goddess of Blisters that had been set up in one of the grand halls was lifted in an elaborate ceremony and accompanied by a large brigade of guards of honor and carried out of the Forbidden City. Both Emperor Tongxi did not recover. His sores grew big and burst, separating unstoppably. On 12 January 1875, he died not yet 19 years of age. He had ruled less than two years. There is an allegation that Siji poisoned him. This is groundless. Many suspect that he died of syphilis, as this disease has very similar symptoms to smallpox. After all, it's sometimes referred as the big pox sometimes. 
And, as modern methods of diagnosis did not exist, nothing definitive can be established. It seems that the court itself was not sure, and did not suspect that the emperor's lifestyle had something to do with the illness. Wang Qingji, his companion, was banished from the court and was banned permanently from official employment. Punishments were met out to Enox close to the emperor, from Canning to exile to the frontiers. A smallpox remained the most likely cause. It was endemic in the capital at the time, and the Emperor Tongxi's only sibling, the Grand Princess, died of it soon afterwards, on the 5th of February. When she was delirious, she murmured that her late father had called on her company to call with her brother. The person who was chosen to accompany the Emperor in death was his wife, Miss Alute, for a woman to take her own life upon her husband's death was deemed a most illustrious virtue. In towns and villages, triumphal arches celebrated them. Miss Aliud, who had been selected for her beach shoes, lived up to those expectations. According to some enoch's, when her husband expired, her father had a food box delivered to her, and when she opened it and found it empty, she knew that he was telling her to starve herself to death. She did as told and was hugely admired for being a worthy daughter to her father. She died 70 days after her husband on 27th of March. Miss Aliud's death has been widely blamed on CG. The Chinese have accused her of ill-treating her daughter-in-law and driving Miss Aliud to suicide. Westerners have asserted that she was pregnant with an heir to the throne and that CG murdered her to secure power. Neither charge is based on any evidence. Although CG may have been severe to Miss Aliud. In fact, Miss Aliud had come from a family who seemed to have embraced suicide as the supreme demonstration of honor. Later on, when Western troops invaded Beijing in 1900 and forced Siji to flee, the entire family of 14 people took their own lives to show their loyalty. For a hundred days from Emperor Tongxi's death, weddings and entertainments were banned in the capital. Throughout the empire, men were forbidden to shave or to have their, thir- their hair cut. In earlier days, Emperor Qianlong had imprisoned officials who had infringed the prohibition during the period of mourning for his wife. All the bells in Beijing temples, both big and small, tolled 30,000 times. Minutely detailed guidance was issued on who was to wear what style on morning ceremonies. The Chinese in those days were arguably the most ceremonious people of earth. A book containing 3,000 rules of etiquette was required in reading for the literati. One of the cardinal rules was that until the late emperor was buried, no music was allowed at court so the forbidden city was hushed away, with subdued figures moving silently about, trailed only by the echoes. The ban on music at court lasted four years, during which Emperor's Tongxi Mausoleum was constructed. The emperor had not built a tomb for himself. He had not been on the throne long enough to begin such a project. After his death, his mother dispatched Prince Chun and Grand Tutor Wen, together with a team of Feng Shui masters, to choose an ideal burial spot for him. Meanwhile, his giant coffin is stayed in a hole in the royal city for senior officials to file past to pay their respects. The coffin was made of a precious wood, painted 49 times in a golden color, adorned with Buddhist symbols and lined with 13 layers of brocade decorated with countless dragons. On the outskirts of Beijing, there were two compounds of mausoleums for the Qin emperors, one to the east and one to the west. There had been a rule that an emperor's mausoleum must be in the same compound as that of his grandfather, not uh, that of his father. As Tongxi late father lay in the ex- eastern mausoleum, he should be buried in the western. But Siji, who was destined to be buried with her husband in the eastern mausoleums, wanted to be near her son, so she buried him there. The grandees expressed understanding of her feelings and raised no objection to this deviation from tradition. Both mausoleum compounds were enormous and were places of serene natural beauty in the embrace of hills, streams and woods. Each mausoleum had an underground chamber and an above-ground edifice that was a replica of a palace in the Forbidden City. At the front were carved white marble pillars with lofty wing-shaped crowns. The most awe-inspiring feature of a mausoleum was its approach, a long straight avenue lined with giant stone statues of elephants and other animals. But there was no such avenue leading to Emperor's Tongxi's mausoleum. The budget would not even stretch to it. 
say you had to choose between spending money on the avenue or on importing hardwood for the coffin and the burial buildings. China was short of top quality wood, and her late husband's mausoleum had had to do with what wood was left from his father's tomb. Seiji, who believed in life and death, wanted the best material for her son in the next world, so she decided to sacrifice the glory of the approach. She bought from overseas the most expensive hardwood, a special king of Nanmu, which was said to be so dense that it would sink rather than float on water. More than four years after Emperor Tongxi's death, his mausoleum was finally ready, and on a day in 1879 picked by the court astrologer as the most auspicious, he and his empress, Miss Aliud, were laid side by side in the underground chamber. Their coffins were weighted down with hundreds of pieces of gold, silver, jade, and assorted jewels. Under Siege's meticulous care, the entombment ceremony was as grand as it had ever been, involving the entire upper echelon of the Beijing bureaucracy trekking 120 kilometers from the capital. 7,920 men took turns to carry the coffin, each shift compromising 120 men. They had been professionally drilled and had bathed carefully before donning purple jackets made of sackcloth, the prescribed material for serious mourning. All officials working within 50 kilometers of the route went to specially constructed memorial halls to greet the coffin in prostration when it passed by. Each memorial hall was illuminated by thousands of large white candles. Although this was all a following established precedent, Siji painstakingly attended to every detail. She really loved her son. Many years later, on an anniversary of his death, the American painter Catherine Carl, who was in the court painting Siji's portrait, wore black. She wrote that Siji realized she was wearing the morning color of the West and seemed much touched. She took my hand in both hers and said, You have a good heart to think of my grief and to have wished to sympathize. And tears fell from her eyes on my hand, which she held in hers.